of glory. Our story begins with a guy called Pierre de Coubertin. I'm gonna be super based here and say that if it wasn't for Pierre de Coubertin, somebody else would have made the Olympics, let's be real. But there are certain specifics about Coubertin that shouldn't really be ignored. I'm not gonna go through his whole life story, there are plenty of other resources for that, so instead I'm just going to point out certain key factors about him. Number one, he was obsessed with aristocracy. He was obsessed with the idea of power. For him, sport was an amazing tool, not only to develop someone's physical strength, but also someone's morality and their intellect. He was obsessed with the gentleman nature of sports. As such, his project also involved a great deal of culture. Pierre de Coubertin started working in the first physical education institutions in France. Keep those in mind, we'll talk about them later. But he wanted to codify sports in a way that could spread internationally and through the up-and-coming modern bureaucracy, right alongside the new industry and the new militarism. For him, the cultural aspect of the Olympics was also a competition. He hosted open invitations for artists to submit their work, and then they would be judged and one would be declared the win. In 1912, though, in Stockholm, they were like, uh, we don't really want to do that. It seems kind of pointless. So he, pretty offended, hosted his own invitational, and this guy who nobody really knew won. Looking into it further, they realized that the name of this author was actually a combination of names of two places. Both names of neighboring villages of the home of his parents-in-law in France. Pierre de Coubertin entered his own competition where he was judging and awarded himself the prize. Anyways, back to his life. When he was studying, he studied at a Jesuit college and there he did a lot of Latin and Greek studies and Neo-Hellenism was pretty big back then. People were doing excavations and finding the ruins of ancient Greece. Interest was rekindled and people were fascinated with the ancient Greek world. Some would say even to the point of romanticism. Pierre obsessed over the Greek world and specifically their definition of sport. And it bears mentioning that the Greeks didn't know as much as we do about medicine and about the human body. For the Greeks, to look good was to be good. To look good was to honor the gods. I mean, okay. Off the record, just between us, Pierre de Coubertin was kinda gay? Oh, <laughs> Not really. He had a wife and whatever, I didn't know him. But he definitely thought very highly of the human body and specifically of muscles. Just like the Greeks, he assigned meaning to that and he wanted to assign some sense of showmanship to them. A sense of self-important culture. Among the other strong hyperfixations of Coubertin was also this rising sense of world identity. Pierre traveled a lot around Europe and he eventually came to Wenlock where they were hosting the Wenlock Games. They were a fair. Yes, they were physical competitions, but also they were kind of jokey, some of them including animals. I think they even chased pigs. Something he noticed was lacking in the Wenlock Games was a sense of pageantry, showmanship. So that's why the Olympics have an opening and a closing ceremony, pretty much. It's also worth mentioning that Coubertin was far from the only one who wanted the games to be revived in this neo-Hellenic way. So after a lot of work, in 1896, the first games were hosted. They were held in Greece, which was very important, obviously, for Coubertin. And something else that's interesting about this era of the Olympics is that even though they did try and bring people from all over the world, pretty much instead of focusing on nationality, they focused on ethnicity. For example, the Greek team had people from Anatolia, the Ottoman Empire, and Cyprus, which was British at the time. And the British team in hand was pretty similar, having people from all over their colonies. It was also, as is to be expected, I guess, a pretty disorganized event. Some athletes even joined the Olympics on the day of. But for Pierre, probably the most important sport in all of these games was the marathon because it's the most symbolic about this Greek revival. In a satisfying way, I think, a Greek athlete won the marathon, and that day was a victory for the entirety of Greece. The games were hosted in 1896, on the exact day of Greek independence. The symbolic power could not have been stronger. Besides small regional competitions, Pierre had a big competitor, 
and those were the World's Fair. They were very different in approach to the Olympics and very different in goal as well. They were very commercial, I mean, arguably commerce was the whole point, however they took a lot of the attention that Pierre wanted. Eventually they won over the consciousness of the public. As the World's Fair declined, the gains... the gains? The games steadily rose, and boy did they rise, we'll get to that later. Pierre was not at the helm of the first games, and he only took control of the IOC a little bit later, and thus the games around the 1910s are closer to his vision than anything else. Later, sorry, he, he sat down in 1924, I think, and by then the Olympics had changed into something else. Unfortunately, spoiler warning, the guy died alone and broke. It is worth recognizing that for the first few years of the 1900s, Pierre's dream had become true. The Olympic dream was manifest. And it was going to crumble very, very quickly. <laughs> Before we talk about the legacy of good old Pierre, we have to understand the context, the world he grew up in. What did he care about? What was he thinking all the time? For that, we need to discuss modernism. I know, I know, I know, I know, I get it. We're all jocks here. We're all distinguished gigachats. We don't care about art. Picasso? More like bitch cop. So don't worry, I'm not gonna assault you with any art talk. This is a safe space for us meatheads. <laughs> So, going way back when, the whole point of the Renaissance was to shift focus back towards humanity and our potential. This, along with some technological advances, brought about the Age of Discovery, in which people traveled all around the world and learned so much. And during these travels, people were exposed to a myriad of things they had never even thought about. New places, new cultures, new animals, new plants. This, naturally, was a huge boom for science with people studying biology, geography, sociology. All of this, little by little, meant that the average person's understanding of the world became significantly better. I mean, still not a lot compared to modern standards, but you know, more than ever before at the time. I wasn't there, but it seems pretty exciting. But you know what also happens when a lot of people travel together? Colonialism! Hooray! Let's put moral questions aside for a moment and talk about what happens to the people that do the colonizing. For one, there is a huge influx in resources, and this is what we saw powered the Industrial Revolution in England, for example. And this means more than just money. Technological advances started going off so far. Trains and steamboats, the printing press became much more efficient. The telegraph as well all of which would later develop into faster forms of communication. But there were also really significant social advancements as well. For one, the standardization of units of measurement, for the most part, but also things such as exhibitions, world's fairs, and congresses. These are very important, keep them in mind. To understand the world a bit better and to cope with this bigger span of information, bureaucracies started showing up institutions dedicated to controlling the flow of information and organizing people. And alongside new bureaucracy, alongside industry, brands started showing up. Attention, brain workers. Do you know that three hours of hard brain work destroys more tissue than does a day of manual labor? And on an even higher scale, as countries began communicating with each other more and trade became much more intricate, the concept of a world stage started to develop. Who's trading with who? Who's warring with who? It all became part of a record and a system formed around it, almost like clout even. All of this is what we call modernism. And let's talk about how it felt on the ground level. People had a very keen awareness of the fact that they were part of a system. Not only that, but they were heavily incentivized to participate in that system, whether it be economic, political, gender, whatever. This is why you get architecture that looks like this or this. The idea was that every person needed the same things to live, a standardized form of living. And you also see that with government, for example, communism. And in modernism, a binary view of gender is very appealing because it's not only structured and easy to understand and pretty much applicable to the whole world, 
but you can also easily ascribe a higher meaning to things. The divine masculine, the divine feminine. Those are values that you can aspire and work towards. You find meaning in the system. And as such, people's reality was formed by society. A collective understanding of the world rather than a personal one. People's expression was very heartfelt and genuine because there was a general optimism around humanity. It seemed achievable to send people to space or to find the best way of life for every human being. Again, it was a very reductive view of the world and it didn't take into account many factors. But in general, people were hopeful. So now let's tie this all back to the Olympics. What I meant when I said that if Pierre hadn't made the Olympics, somebody else would, is precisely the fact that this obsession with a system and with a global community was something that was in a lot of people's minds. I'm not here to fully discredit Pierre. There are many things about the Olympics that are specific to the way he wanted and the way he made them. And I'm sure he worked in so many ways that I don't even have a clue about. So I get it. But it is worth mentioning that there was a systemic focus on the world and our interactions around it. And part of the way that the Olympics work, and I guess would always work, is the power of the symbol. One does not do sport to win. They do so for the power of practice, of perseverance. Just as an example, in one of the earlier Olympics in Paris, there were no medals. It was all about the thrill of competition itself. And with the rest of bureaucracy also came the institutions of medicine, sport, and very important for Pierre, physical education. A lot of the early Olympic strategy revolved around physical education. And all of these show an intense obsession with record keeping, cataloging the body and what it can do, witnessing and recording the best of humanity. Okay, I hope this gives you an idea of what was going on through Pierre's and his peers through Pierre and Pierre's brains while they made the Olympics. I'll see you in a bit, but let's get back to the video. Right. It's time we talk about that special guest of the Olympics, the one who no one invites but is always there. It's time we talk about steroids. It's pretty hard to know who was the first person to do steroids at the Olympics because believe it or not, there was a time where that wasn't even tested. Unfortunately, most of what we know about the early days are accidents. In 1952 in Oslo, three speed skaters got sick from using amphetamines. In the summer games in Helsinki, there were rumors that certain delegation, I'll let you guess which one, were using testosterone in the weightlifting. Bob Hoffman of the US delegation learned about this and actually confirmed it with the Soviets. And when he learned the truth, he actually went back to his delegation, back to his home country, and evangelized the use of testosterone and specifically the anabol. It's pretty hard to know the extent of that, but you can make your own guess. News broke, however, in 1960, when Dutch cyclist Knut Jensen had an accident. He fell off his bike and he hit the back of his head. And the accident was quite severe. He would never wake up again. Blood work revealed he had vasodilators and amphetamines in his body, but later tests actually showed that he probably died from the fracture to his skull. However, the public had heard the news and it forced the IOC to act. Two years later, in 1962, the IOC developed their own committee to test for drugs. However, it wasn't very effective. They didn't fully know what they were doing. So it wasn't very effective, at least for the first five years. As an example, in 1968, a Swedish athlete of the modern pentathlon failed, but due to alcohol. In 1972, seven athletes had failed the test, but due to caffeine. An American swimmer got stripped of a gold medal after finding ephedrine in his body, although that's an asthma medication. Several years down the line, WADA would be formed. More than anything else, WADA just showed how widespread the problem was. A lot of this is not the responsibility of the individual athletes taking these substances. Many of them were part of state-sponsored very wide programs of giving steroids to these athletes. And it shouldn't really be surprising that from the 60s to the 80s, roughly, so many Olympic records were being smashed left and right every single time. It got to the point so well known that this, I think he was a US uh, weightlifter as well, he commented that we will see which steroids are better, the Soviets or mine. 
And there's also so many other cases, like Ben Johnson or Flojo. That latter one particularly breaks my heart. I mean, I have no way of knowing that her death had anything to do with drugs, but she died really young and it's, it's just heartbreaking. And then, yeah. Several documents came out revealing the state-sponsored doping of several athletes in the 2014 Sochi Olympics. And that turned out in the banning of the Russian delegation in the Olympics. That's why if you look at the Olympics today, they don't really show Russian athletes. They compete under the Olympic banner. Do you really think the IOC was that naive? I don't know. Steroids seem to go directly against the purpose of the Olympics. The Olympics are this hopeful and optimistic view of humanity. And if you cheat at them, there's just no point. <sighs> Don't do steroids, at least not at the Olympics. And instead, give them to me. Give me the roids. Give me the steroids. Give For good old Pierre, the Olympics were apolitical. They had nothing to do with what was going on and they were all about the love of sport. Something which no one agreed with. <laughs> I mean, not even the ancient Greeks, let's be real. The Greeks realized the power in the Olympics not only to diffuse territorial tensions between people, but also for the politicians to be seen amongst each other. Back then, the flow of information was way slower, so if you could just make yourself known, that meant more plus as a chance to travel, because who doesn't love to travel? Talking about more specific Olympics, we talked about LA and Berlin, and how those felt more like a stage rather than a city. The organizing committees used the full extent of the Olympics for pageantry, a very powerful tool that they understood. People will always pay attention to the games, and you can use that in your favor. The Nazis did, the early capitalists did, in Lenny Riefrench's Sos Olympia, we can see a similar attitude that Pierre de Gourtan had, although this time it was furthering the ideology of the <laughs> Through showmanship, the <laughs> showed the ideal of a human. But it is such a vague concept that it has as much grounds in reality as Coubertin's neo-Hellenism. But beyond propaganda, because there was a lot, but beyond that, Hitler was there at the games, pretty much for every event, congratulating the winners and, you know, expecting salutes. The United States has obviously been doing this all along as well. In 1932, they used it to promote the LA way of life. Capitalist with a heavy focus on land ownership. They did so again in Lake Placid, and again in Atlanta, and again, and again, and again. Each time they did so with a slightly different intent, furthering their own specific goals at the time. The aesthetics of 1948 London and the way it brought people together was also used to prove that the UK was still standing strong after World War II. The media, back then and now, has such a big sway on how people think of other countries, obviously. A country that made really good use of the Olympics is Japan. They were supposed to host the 1940 Olympics, but then, uh, something came up. Actually, Japan has a tendency of... Hmm. Anyways, in 1964, they were faced with a very big challenge of rejuvenating the country. It was a pretty big project of social infrastructure, but they also wanted to change the nation's perception of themselves. They did so in many ways, you know, aesthetics, culture, but also they codified Judo. Judo was a softer martial art, one that did not rely so heavily on weight class and more instead on technique. Wait a minute, hold on. As it was making its way into the IOC, it was also firmly in the army and the police, and eventually it would even make its way to the schools. It was seen as a way to elevate oneself, and this softer way of teaching sport is also seen in other places of the world at the time. The YMCA in the US codified volleyball, a more relaxed way of teaching oneself physical education, improving oneself. So anyway, judo. It was the first 
Asian sport to be added into the Olympics and that of course was very appealing to the IOC who was trying very hard to be seen as more international than it actually kind of was. In the judo competition they had weight classes but they also had an open weight class and that one was very important for the Japanese. They made it to the finals and it was Japan versus Netherlands. In an astonishing show of technique the Dutchman won. And when the Dutch delegation started cheering for him, the athlete stopped them and bowed to the Japanese, showing respect. So yeah, Japan did a really good job of boosting their economy, but they also worked really hard on their national identity. And this did not go unnoticed. 1968, Mexico. Pedro Ramirez Vázquez, who was a modernist architect, he thought that the least important part of the Olympics was the athletic events. As such, he organized a nine month long cultural program that was supposed to boost the cultural sense in Mexico. We were competitors, we were cosmopolitan, we were cool and edgy. Something else, if you don't mind. <laughs> but as many of you know, that was just a facade. But there's only so far where a cultural festival can take you. If you commit atrocities, the people will know. This unfortunate dichotomy of promoting peace and culture and unity while at the same time covering up national, you know, embarrassments is sadly a long tradition in the Olympics. Japan, who we were just talking about, they just swept up and hid away so many of their homeless population. But despite their impact on his life, he says he hopes they succeed. And as we get closer to contemporary times, this has not stopped or slowed down at all. The opening ceremonies have gotten bigger, more expensive, more showy. 2012 and 2016 were actually led by filmmakers. China is actually a pretty good example for this. When they put their bid forward for 2008, it wasn't as much to prove themselves to be equal to the rest of the world, but more to socially validate their view of government. Pretty much the same as always, the world expected to see values of a united world, global, whereas China showed that they are a sovereign state demanding respect, on an equal playing field as everyone else, but different and unmoving at that. All along, I've been trying to figure out what exactly the Olympics are for, and the more I look into it, it just seems that it means different things for different people. For many athletes, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to prove their talent. For other athletes, it's a legacy that they are a part of and something they go to repeatedly, something they are known for. For the average viewer like us, it's an opportunity to see incredible feats of humanity, willpower and determination. It's an inspiration. And for the world governments, going beyond the whole city, it's also a chance for them to validate their view of how humanity should be led. So I kind of lied to you earlier. I did do some exclusive interviews for this video. I talked to my friends and I asked them general opinions about what they think the Olympics are for. Most people said something along the lines of for honor or for the honor of your country, things like that. A few people said it was a benchmark for athletic improvement but one person, one person, said it was for global unity. And I know that my friend group is not necessarily a very good reflection of, you know, people who are interested in the Olympics, especially because they're not. <laughs> but it goes to show that if the Olympics are part of this world identity, this global culture, people take what they want out of it. But yeah, Pierre, they're not political. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> What do you think of this getup? Damn, son, where'd you find this? It's probably my favorite outfit of this whole video. I love this garment. One time I wore this to a nightclub and this girl thought I actually was a Cuban gymnast. So... She was drunk though. <laughs> Alright, I'm done for today. Hey, welcome back. If you want to take a break, now would be a prime time to do so. Break time. Now, if you're still with me, let's talk about postmodernism. I know you hate that word, and honestly, 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 
I can't say I blame you. <laughs> Postmodernism just sucks. <laughs> so I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it and we're just gonna sail through. Don't worry, it'll be easy. So, 1920s, World War I. Then, World War II. And at the end, the atomic bombs. That was a lot. The general hopeful attitude that modernism had brought to humanity was tested, to say the least. <laughs> Peoples from all over the world were committing atrocities and they were being recorded, broadcast, and shown to the world. The hope that humanity could achieve anything was suddenly washed by the horror that we could inflict on ourselves and also on the world around us, but that would become more important later on, put a pin on that. And if it was our governments that led us to both world wars, this also brought with it a very intense questioning of authority. Why should we listen to you if you're responsible for this, and this, and this, and this, and many more? And it was also clear that there was no one way of doing things. Capitalism pulled us apart through class divide, and fascism hid all of its injustices through aesthetics. So to use the same example, buildings now looked like this and like this. Weird on purpose. I mean, it's not to say I don't like them, some of these buildings are very cool, but some of them are, are just weird on purpose. And another easy way to understand this, gender. The dichotomy of male and female became less appealing and in fact people actually found more power in breaking the rules. People expressed their personality through a blending of the two or breaking apart entirely. And that reveals one of the core aspects of postmodernism. It is inherently tied to the individual. You couldn't trust the government, or even the church in many cases, so your moral compass, your version of reality, had to be dictated by your own self. We became aware of the fact that everything is filtered through our own perception of reality. And this means nothing had any inherent meaning. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about art, but sometimes people asking why is this art is the whole point of that art. And this deconstruction obviously happened in more significant places like the government. Fascist powers fell, communism and capitalism had to reinvent themselves. It was a whole journey and we're still feeling the effects of it really. And for the regular person, everything that was going on just caused a lot of angst. Because a narrative could be flipped on you at any moment, people were afraid to be genuine and sentimental and this gave irony the center stage. Okay, so how does this all tie to the Olympics? Unsurprisingly, mostly through its dissidents. <laughs> On one hand, the golden rule of amateurism was finally put to rest. But more important than that, Olympic scandals became bigger and more widespread and more brutal. The US aiding police brutality in Mexico, or South Korean social purification projects, which were the systematic killing and exploitation of vulnerable people, or without invoking death, the massive wide-scale problem that was steroids. It wasn't single athletes cheating, it was a systemic state-sponsored problem. And people obviously started asking what was the point of the Olympics? Why do we need to know who can jump the highest? How does that help us? Those are some pretty big questions. And as you can imagine, a lot of people were not ready to look for answers. But for the public, things would never be the same. And honestly, you probably already know this from your own experience. Oh, sheesh. No. Okay, that's enough art student talk for now. Let's get back to the video, but I'll see you back here in a while. Let's talk about what probably are my favorite Olympics, those being London 2012, Rio 2016, and Tokyo 2020. The amount of online content there is about them, so I can just binge for hours. Please, first champion in almost a game. She's got a real lightness about her work. Situation and time is not your friend.
But today we are not here to talk about the internet, we are actually here to talk about the effects of the Olympics, and more specifically the environmental effects. It's hard to know the specifics of environmental impact regarding the Olympics from before 2000, but starting with the Sydney Olympics, the IOC included environmental effects into its three core tenets, those being sports, culture, and now environmental effects. But as you'll see, it's a little bit hard to know how much exactly they care about it. Okay, okay, uh, that's a little harsh. Let's start at the beginning. Sydney was the first Green Olympics and they had a number of different actions they took. Most notably, reusable energy regarding transportation and to power the Olympic Village. Not bad. However, one of the promises in their bid is that they would be good about the air conditioning, which they weren't. And in case you don't know, air conditioning is really bad for the ozone. That alongside some uh, dubious garbage disposal practices. Whoops. Athens 2004 is infamous for reasons, but it wasn't all bad. They planted around a million bushes and 350,000 trees. Most of their energy was non-renewable. and They just completely destroyed one of their last remaining wetlands. It's kind of sad, but also within the city. Many of the Olympic venues were just left deserted. Many of them still haven't been bought by anyone, so they're just sitting there collecting dust. So in general, not very good. London 2012. They had some pretty good ideas this time around. For one, a lot of the construction material for the Olympic venues is recycled. Good. They did a lot of rainwater harvesting for purposes to be used in the Olympic Village. I don't know what you know about this, but it kind of rains a lot in London. And they also planted 4,000 trees and half a million different plants. Pretty alright. The downsides might be less than the previous Olympics, but they're still pretty bad. And they come in something you wouldn't think about, the metals. They were manufactured by a dubious company, with really bad environmental habits and even more human rights violations. For its long history of contempt for labor rights and human rights, environmental destruction, not least of which in the communities from which the Olympic gold medals are sourced, and general opposition to anything that could be described as sustainable. Thank you and well done. So, now it's time to talk about Rio, and there's a lot to be said on many regards, but for now we're gonna stick to the environmental side. Let's start with the positives. For one, food was, for the most part, pretty sustainably sourced. They learned the lesson from London, and the metals were made much better using recycled materials, which also cut down on the chemicals needed. Some venues got repurposed, not all of them though. We'll get to Tokyo in a second, but just as a comparison, 3.6 million, 340,000. Anyway, we're not done with Rio. So much sewage disposal was just dumped into a bay, which was already pretty overpolluted by the time they started. The preparations also completely destroyed a very unique bioreserve that had so many species of butterflies and plants. And with their bid, keeping the ecology in mind, they promised 24 million trees would be planned. They only planned 8 million, not even half. Pretty bad, Rio, I'm not gonna lie. That wasn't the worst of your offenses, was it? Hmm. And now, Tokyo. Tokyo is a very special case. For one, it was the first carbon neutral Olympics. A little asterisk on that one. It's also because there weren't any spectators, at least for most of the events. So that helped keep a lot of the emissions down, but yeah. The energy requirements were met, and almost all of it was from renewable sources. The podiums were pretty cool, they were made from recycled plastics, and even cooler, the metals were made from e-waste. That's awesome! Also, I almost forgot, but the athletes slept on cardboard beds which were recycled after the games. Pretty cool. Alright, I need to talk more about this because... These beds, man. <laughs> These beds. <laughs> so when the Olympics finally started in Tokyo, there was this thing on Twitter where people were claiming that the beds were made of cardboard to um, discourage intimacy. <laughs> and then there's this. The fact that this is real. <laughs> so this is all fake news. Fake news. But I still love it. Look at this. <laughs> So way back, the Olympic Village was just for men and the women were hosted elsewhere. Talk about LA, but eventually, obviously, they started hosting them together. So put these athletes and their teams 24-7 together and, you know, 
it's bound to happen. So from 1988, if I remember correctly, they started giving the athletes condoms. And I think it's three, but I lost that source, so I'm really kicking myself. But whatever, back then it was mostly to stop the spread of STDs and specifically HIV. And the fact that this time around COVID was a thing, people used that to prove that the beds were meant to keep the athletes apart. <laughs> Nah, the beds are not designed that way for celibacy. I think they were presented in 2019 first, so this is before Ms. Rona came knocking. I love these beds, they're an absolutely iconic part of Tokyo 2020, and honestly I kinda want one. It's probably the only way to stop me from having this much sex. Which is, as you can tell, very modernist. The Olympics have never shied away from making money and have always found different ways of doing so. At first, and up to 1924 in Paris, most of the money came from journalists who were buying the rights for images taken there at the Olympics. But Los Angeles in 1932 completely changed the game on how the Olympics made money. First of all, they had kind of an easy job because LA had no shortage of sports venues already there. And specifically at that time, LA was being just swallowed up by real estate agents. So the prospect of an Olympic village, which was the first time they made one, was very lucrative for them. I don't think they quite sold the houses that they used for the Olympic Village. I think they took them down, but they definitely used them as a blueprint to make more houses. And they also had the radio there, which significantly increased income. Of course, this means more people will be tuning in, but also more advertisers. More money. And radio was far from the only medium that really increased revenue at the Olympics. Both Germany and Japan showed a significant rise in people buying TVs when they hosted the Olympics. It's pretty much thanks to TV that the Olympics became a really worldwide media phenomenon. And it was around Tokyo where the discussion of money really began ramping up in many different sides. Both Munich and Mexico cost half a billion dollars to host. Whereas Japan, who significantly invested more, also saw a pretty big increase in GDP. I think it was double per capita? But regardless of the specific amount, Tokyo 1964 really showed the world that the Olympics could be used as a way to rejuvenate a country, to boost the economy, and to propel the whole city to new heights. But this also came at a cost. Tokyo had some pretty impressive architecture for the Olympics and they made a bigger spectacle that had ever been done before. And this would be a trend that would keep up pretty much forever so far. Future Olympics had to really consider how much money they would be spending on venues, as well as on the spectacle, the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony, and just the general aesthetics of the city. Anyways, moving on to the 1984 LA Olympics, that was its own can of worms. As I said before, LA already had a pretty big conference centers, sports clubs, swimming pools, universities to host the athletes in, and they just had to, you know, give a facelift to the Olympic Coliseum. But here is where they did something different. They avoided subsidizing the cost of the games and instead had private companies pitch in. McDonald's sponsored the swimming pool and the owner of 7-Eleven sponsored a velodrome. The 1984 Olympic Velodrome in Los Angeles. 7-Eleven, the dream begins with freedom. They only allowed one type of product to sponsor each part. For example, one official beverage, one official food, one official energy, one official transportation, whatever. This ensured exclusivity deals which could raise the cost even higher. McDonald's, IBM, Coke, they all pitched in. And as you can notice with these companies, they are also multinational. And while they were not allowed to advertise at the games themselves, outside of the venues, it was open season. The games of the 23rd Olympiad tomorrow. Budweiser salutes the coaches and trainers of the 1984 U.S. Olympic team. Look, it's the Canon Snappy 84 to commemorate the 84 Olympics. Arco developed a ship to map the ocean floor, mile by mile by mile. Saluting our Olympic athletes. For someone like David here, to go for the Olympic gold takes a real commitment. Hi, I'm Kurt Thomas for Shop and Save, and they... But you know... Something about seeing the Olympics. Get you thinking. And those guys out there. 
So yeah, the government not having to spend too much on the games as well as private sponsorships made it so the LA games were an economic success. Now this talk about money pretty much only addresses the venues and infrastructure needed to host the games, but there was another side which was just taking up money, the opening and the closing ceremonies. You remember Lenny Riefenstahl's film Olympia? That movie was very successful and Future Olympics wanted to replicate the media success that that was. So they had to basically make real-time movies at the opening and closing ceremonies. As an example, the London 2012 opening ceremony cost $45 million and Beijing cost $120 million. To host the entirety of the games, Barcelona spent $5 billion and those games were considered a success. Sydney, $3 billion, a little bit less, but you know. And Athens, post 9-11, skyrocketed up to $16 billion. Athens, what are you doing? Some sources claim Beijing spent $6.5 billion. And this included a very robust security program with 3,000 CCTV cameras installed around the city specifically in public transport as well, I think. London came in a little below Beijing, costing only $2.4 billion, and they also had their own security campaign, which also included CCTV cameras. In fact, some people criticized the designers of the mascots. Uh, what are you guys called? Mandeville and Wenlock, I don't know which one is which. Don't do it. Some people pointed out the irony in London when they invested so much into CCTV cameras, and then they made mascots that look like this. Are you guys spying on me? We can monitor your voice and data system 24 hours a day. Yeet! And anyway, the one who really takes the cake, Rio 2016, 20 billion dollars! At the time, Rio was embroiled in this pretty massive scandal involving corruption. So, yeah, I'm sure they did not play a part at all in this. There's so many stories in this. Like, I remember the mayor of Montreal, after hosting the games, he got into such a big debt, and he actually managed to pass it on to the next mayor. Thanks a lot, you idiot. So, yeah, a lot of people have been complaining about the ever escalating price to host the Olympics and wondering how much it's worth it. How much is it worth it, specifically when many Olympic venues just end up floating in the city with no purpose? I definitely don't think I'm the right person to answer that question. So instead, I'll leave you with the beautiful fun fact that to put forward a bid, you know, before you know if your country will be shortlisted or not, the host city has to pay $150,000. Stay classy, IOC. Always. Or should I say, stay classicist? <laughs> Atención. What does it mean to the LA Games in practical terms? I know what it means to the athletic community. Hey, welcome back. I know it's been a lot, but we're in the home stretch now and all the tough parts are over. I want to talk to you about one more thing, and we're gonna do this entirely unscripted. Let's talk about metamodernism. Now, it's important to understand social currents like we're talking about don't work like a switch. You're not modern one day and then wake up postmodern the next. These things take time and are honestly mostly used by people studying the past rather than studying the present, which is very important. But many people say that metamodernism is the cultural era that we are on right now. The thing is, with modernism and postmodernism, despite both being a response to each other, are also bound by the same limitations which is to say, both have the same obsessions. Modernism highlights the good of the system, the power of the collective. Postmodernism cannot stop tearing down the system and it is incredibly self-centered. Neither is ideal. So, how do we move forward? Metamodernism. Metamodernism tries to combine the best parts of both. It adopts the optimism of modernism with the self-aware cynicism of postmodernism. I find it's best to speak from both logic and emotion. It's kind of self-aware, but then also not. Metamodernism was first described pretty recently and by someone way smarter than me, so I don't have that many examples to show you. So, instead of discussing architecture or art or politics, let's talk about memes. 
Back in the early days of internet memes, they were very base level, very simple, one idea. The memes that we have now are a lot more socially complex. Compare like this meme and this meme. They're so different. This one is very simple and this one has a lot of layers to it. This one is making fun of a person while this one is making fun of both a person and the reader. I mean, if you relate. Which I guess is one of the core aspects of metamodernism, relatability. We know we're all different, but we understand each other. There are many YouTube videos that describe metamodernism way better than I could, so I'm going to link them below. But basically, cringe culture is dead, we're all fools, and we're all in this together. Our societies are falling apart, probably beyond repair, but we never stop working towards happiness. Metamodernist media, like the memes we discussed, tend to express heartfelt messages in an ironic format. While I can't help but be so fascinated by metamodernism, I also can't help but think it's not going to last very long. The world doesn't have that long to worry about cringe culture or about self-awareness before the world explodes and there's not a lot you can do about it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. So how does this all tie to the Olympics? I don't actually know. The Olympics has always been a very big institution with a lot of moving parts. Socially updating and modernizing has never been one of its defining features. People don't spend that much time thinking about the Olympics, but I think they're a great way to understand the world around us. At least, in essence. I think something pretty metamodern about the Olympics is how we can root for a national team and yet our favorite athletes be from another country. And I wish I could spend hours more talking about my favorite athletes and sharing stories that I love, but I don't have the time for that or the energy. I hope this video was at least a little bit helpful in understanding the world we live in and kind of maybe where we're going. Maybe. All that said, I have been Doc and hosting you has been a genuine pleasure. All right, everybody, we made it. We made it the whole way through. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. I put so many hours of work into it, but just to share the love, I think it's worth it. For now, thanks again for watching.